Lord, we thank you for your word, and Father, I just come before you a a broken vessel, Lord, and I just pray that this morning would be balanced, Lord. One sister told me this morning that she appreciates the way that I can preach and teach with care, and at the same time, talk about sin, and it's a seesaw. It's really a hard thing to, to accomplish, to be able to, to speak the truth in love. But we know that the truth must go forth because love without truth is hypocrisy and truth without love is brutality. And so it's that balance. And Lord, I pray for that balance this morning. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Good morning, one and all. This morning we're in John chapter 8, if you'll turn there. I use the New King James translation, Chuck Smith Study Bible. And so if you're wondering if yours doesn't quite match up, and we do have Bibles in the back. If you need a Bible, raise your hand, and we'll get a Bible to you. And so does anyone need a Bible? Fernando, hey, Fernando's here. All right. And another Bible right up front here, please. Thank you. Okay, this morning's message is called Adultery Part 2 and 3. Last week we had Adultery Part 1. This week we're having Adultery Part 2 and 3. Make sense? Okay, last week we went through, starting with verse 1 in chapter 8, we go through systematically, but Jesus went to the Mountain of Olives, And now early in the morning, he came again into the temple. And so we find Jesus inside of the temple. Now, for some reason, many people have a mindset that Jesus was out in a field someplace, or out, but not in the temple when this this incident, this event took place. But he was inside of the temple. And all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. We know that in that day, the rabbi, the teacher would sit down And the people would stand up and be taught. Things have reversed over time. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. They bring to him this woman, and she's actually been caught in the act of adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law, because At this time, the law was supreme. It was all about the law, the Ten Commandments and and the rest of the law, the Deuteronomic law, the the Levitical law, the laws of Moses that God gave Moses. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. Now this stoned isn't what you, you know, sometimes some generations said, oh, stoned. No, this is taking stones and throwing them, and they were designed not to kill you right away, but to cause suffering before you died, but they would stone them. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they, may have, might, that they might have something of which to accuse him. We know this was a trap they were laying. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Again and again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one. Now where did they go out? They went out somewhere, probably in the temple, lurking in some corner and scheming and thinking of what they can come up with next, probably beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Then Jesus spoke to them again, to the scribes and Pharisees there in the temple. Now they've, he's found them or they've found him, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. 
You see, Jesus came to bring life to sinners, not to come and bring death to sinners. His whole thing was to bring life to the people, to forgive sin, and to empower the people. Now, during the week, as often, often I do, I got feedback about last Sunday's sermon, both from live stream watchers as well as listeners here. One brother told me his, he and his family come here because I'm not afraid to speak up when it comes to biblical convictions and sin. And I know there's, there's many in that group. But also mentioned that it, it may have appeared that last week I shied away from some particular sexual sins and, and I addressed some, not others. And a, a live streamer also agreed with the, the first brother. And, and, you know, the thing is, I can always find more to say about a subject. Always. And every time at the, the Sunday afternoon, I'm always thinking of, oh, and sometimes someone will point a scripture out to me uh, that, that I could have used. And, and I'm always thinking, oh, I could have said that. My, my friend Davin, he tells me, don't beat yourself up over it, you know, because I used to love it when we had two services because the second service was always so much easier and better because I could fill in all the things I forgot to say the first service. But now with one service, I don't have that luxury. I can always find more to say. And now we live in this instant feedback time. And, and I appreciate the feedback. I really do. I really do appreciate it. And truth be, I don't think the Lord is ever going to judge me when my time, my time comes as a teacher. And we know that the teachers get judged. The pastor gets judged in, in some way, uh, uh, taking things from rewards away or whatever but in some way more than a person who isn't in that position gets, gets judged. And, and you know, so be it, that's the way it is. But I'm not afraid that someday I'm going to be judged because I didn't talk enough about sexual sin. I know in my heart that I talk, when we come to the scriptures, I don't shy away, I do talk about it. And I do appreciate the feedback. And going through the Bible, we end up covering it all. And I was educated to preach it all, and I do. And on the other hand, I want to be an equal opportunity preacher. I don't want to be harping week after week on any one particular sexual sin or any group of sin, or for that matter, on any one particular group of sinners, because that's plain wrong. That's hypocritical. That's wrong, because we're all sinners. And you've got to be careful when you put yourself on the Christian bandwagon or soapbox, that you don't end up falling off and getting hurt if you're going to do that often enough. And when you make it a habit of hammering on some particular group of sinners, sooner or later, you're going to hammer your own thumb with that hammer. That's how it works. Or you're going to hammer the, finger that, the fingers you're pointing with. That's how it works, sooner or later. And sooner or later, you're probably going to become more like those that you're pointing at. Like one pastor who, who they, uh, an elder right during service came up because there was a little group he was representing and grabbed the pastor, by, it was an Assemblies of God pastor, a guy I knew. And he grabbed him by his, his shirt collar and his tie right in front of everyone and said, your problem, pastor, is you don't love enough. You don't love the people. As he's shaking the guy like a rag doll. <laughs> and what had happened is, Maybe the pastor didn't. I knew the pastor, and he was a bit legalistic, to say the least, and, and, and maybe harsh, and, and maybe they were kind of like giving him some of his own medicine. But what had happened is they, because they didn't forgive, they didn't love enough themselves, they took on his sin. And that's how it happens. And that goes for stereo, stereotyping any group, politicians, Democrats, Republicans, used car salesmen, tax collectors, prostitutes. Those are all the people Jesus hung out with. He loved them. Amen? And that's the whole point. That's one of the major points of chapter 8. Jesus came to bring life to sinners, not death to sinners. He came up against the Pharisaic spirit of sin sniffers. But along the way, over centuries, Christians sometimes got it somewhere along the line, got it backwards. And the mantra became death to sinners, but not us. Death to adulterers, because I don't have that problem, was a common mantra back in the time of Jesus as well. 
And in John 8, Jesus answers the question of how to treat sinners with love. Not You don't condone the sin, you don't love the sin, but you love the sinner. And it was a lesson the scribes and Pharisees needed to hear. And nothing's changed. It's a lesson we need to hear. He said to her, you are caught right in the act. He said to her, you are forgiven, go and sin no more. Where are your accusers? Are any of them left? No. Well, then you're forgiven. Go and sin no more. And then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness. No, we're not to walk in sin, but have the light of life. And last week, I, I'll be honest with you, I prayed about it and I thought about it, how much I was going to devote, whether it would just be adultery part one or whether there'd ever be a part two or three. And it wasn't until five, ten minutes ago that I came up with part three. I only had part two today. And that was going to be it. And then I part threed it. But my thinking, to be honest with you, last week was that at least 100% of the people here know what adultery is. And the at least 100% of the people here are 100% against it. That was my thinking. And last week, I was coming from the place that spending a lot of time talking specifically about adultery is like preaching to the choir for this group. But assuming is always risky. Now, I have to say that statistically, this church has, a, has an incredibly low divorce rate. Incredibly low. I can't even remember over the last 25 years, but maybe two divorces of people in our church. And that's awesome. That's incredible. And so in some respects, it is like preaching to the choir in some respects. But by popular demand, let's make sure. Let's see. Maybe at the end of this message, you're going to say, yeah, he just preached to the choir. Or not. Maybe you'll say, hey, the Holy Spirit preached right at me. Let's find out. And I'll leave it to the Holy Spirit to answer that question for you. He's already answered it to me because I've already gone through this. And I'm not going to spoil you. I want you to know that I'm not because, you know, someone comes and says, hey, you know, uh, I really wish you had extended that study, that you had gone deeper into it. Then, then you know, every week I'm going to, to, to take that and, and, and then come back with, with more, no, 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 no. You know, this is like, you know, I'm not a one-timer, but, but it's not an every-timer either. That's not the way it works. But let's start with the dictionary definition of adultery. Now, number one, by definition, adultery is, and this is X-rated, so if there are any, okay, I don't see any, yeah, okay, not listening, but that's good. Um, um, it's a little bit x-rayed, so put your hands over your young kid's ears if you're sensitive about that. But adultery is voluntary sexual intercourse between a married person and someone other than his or her lawful spouse. Okay? That's the dictionary definition. And the dictionary definition is pretty much the Old Testament definition. It doesn't have to be two married people. It can be a married person with a single person. It can be a married person with another married person. But if you're married and you're having sex with anyone who you're not married to, the biblical definition is that's adultery. I hope we can all have that baseline. By definition, if you're not married and you're having intimacy with anyone, it's also fornication. And maybe you're thinking, well, I don't have to worry about those things. I don't even come remotely into that picture. I would never do that. Well... In this nation, adultery along with fornication has become a national disgrace, a national disaster, a destroyer of marriages, families, and homes by the millions. And it's eating away at the fabric of our nation like a cancer. It really is. And here's some cold, hard truth about ad adultery in our country. And this is not internet rumor. This isn't fable. This isn't the stuff that you find on the internet that you, you research, and it's just not true. This is true. This is fact. There's an extramarital affair dating website. And this site is now aiming to IPO imminently to raise $200 million. I mean, we're talking like this month. To raise $200 million to expand 
a ma massive expansion. An IPO is an initial public offering where a private company offers their stock or whatever, and you can buy into it, and then they usually will end up on the New York Stock Exchange or the London Stock Exchange after the, the IPO is a success. And so this company is offering the first sale of their shares to the public, that which will lead to a stock market listing. And however, according to an interview with Bloomberg, Bloomberg is America's big financial guru. I'm sure you, you probably have heard of Bloomberg. In the interview, the extramarital adultery site head of international relations said, the site is aiming to launch the IPO in London because, I quote, apparently Europe's liberal attitudes toward adult, towards adultery would be more favorable for an IPO. Even though the website said that 50% of its business currently comes from the United States. Europe is the only region where we have a real chance of doing an IPO because of its more liberal attitudes toward adultery. Now this is what actually was said in the Bloomberg report. The site owners claim, we're no longer a niche, but it's been difficult in North America to find the support to go public, meaning to offer a public financial buy-in. Now remember, 50% of their business is from America. That means 18 million married Americans pay to be members of this dating site looking for another married person to commit sin with. But apparently, we Americans don't like to, la to, sh to have our dirty laundry exposed. We like to hide it. Europeans don't really care. Now, the site claims to be the second largest dating website in the world, just behind Match.com. And they already have 36 million members in 46 countries. And they made $115 million last year in 2014. When I think of how that money could have been spent, it makes me sick. I want to vomit to think of how it was spent. And I just hope no one I know is paying to engage in this service. And I, could w I wish I could say there are no so-called Christians or Christians in the ranks of that membership. But I know the devil's busy. And I know statistically that there are. And this is all becoming part of this new norm. And so in our nation, physical adultery is alive and thriving. The new norm is nothing new under the sun, though. It's just that a lot more people are participating in the old sin norm than ever before. You know, God gave laws in Leviticus 20, way back in the Old Testament, in verse 10, if there is a man who commits adultery with another man's wife, one who commits adultery with his friend's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Adultery has always been considered serious business, historically a sin to be brought to the temple, to the church to deal with, always, up until now. Another example found in Numbers 5, if you as an Old Testament husband had suspicions, you suspected your wife of being unfaithful, you could take her to the temple, to the tabernacle, where the priest would pour holy water into an earthen vessel and dust from the floor and he would use this as some form of, of judgment depending on, on, on what would happen, if the woman would get sick or not and, and her legs would swell up, all these different things. And if she was guilty, her belly would swell, her legs would tremble, and, if she, and then she would be a curse among her people. If she was innocent, and they weren't looking for guilt always, they were looking for innocence also, and, and then they would know. And then, of course, there's the classic example of adultery in the Bible, which is, we went over it yesterday at the men's breakfast, David, King David. In 2 Samuel 12, verse 5, or actually, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 12, we find the, the uh, no, back in chapter 12, we're going to start with verse 1. Then the Lord sent Nathan the prophet to David, and he came to him and said to him, there were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him, this, this ewe, this little lamb, baby lamb. And a traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb 
and prepared it for the man who had come to him. And so King David's anger was greatly aroused against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this in my kingdom shall surely die, and he shall restore fourfold for the lamb. Give that the poor man four lambs for the one he took, because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. You took Bathsheba from Uriah. And moving down to verse 13, so David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. David repented. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. However, because by this deed you've given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, whenever we as Christians do something wrong, when we're caught in sin, it's, it's just, you know, it shames the body of Christ. When a pastor falls, it shames the body of Christ. The, the, the devil loves to use these things. Loves it. Does a dance. The child also who is born to you shall surely die. Then Nathan departed to his house. Nathan, of course, was a prophet. Now to summarize, so after committing adultery with Bathsheba and then murdering her husband, Uriah, King David is sitting with Nathan, relaxing in the palace with the prophet, thinking, hey, I've got my own Billy Graham right here. And it was there in the palace that Nathan said to David, there's a poor man who lives next door to the wealthy. And, you know, the man took his family pet, basically killed it, served it to a guest at the meal. And what? What shall be done? And David put him to death. Now, of course, Nathan's story was about David's own sin of adultery. David was hanging himself when he said that the man shall surely die. Nathan's story was designed by Nathan to bring sin home to David. And it worked. David got it. He was the man in the story. And he repented and was forgiven. And we know in the New Testament, what does it say about David? Huh? A man after God's own heart. That's the saving grace. That's the forgiving grace that God had for David and has for us and that we need to have for sinners, including ourselves. Sometimes we don't forgive our own self. Now, the Holy Spirit's an equal opportunity convictor. And I said convictor, not condemner. The enemy condemns, accuses. The Holy Spirit convicts. And the conviction is not like in a court of law where you're you're convicted of a crime and you get a 10-year sentence. No, it's just a making you aware, giving you the conviction of what's right and what's wrong is what the Holy Spirit conviction is all about. That's all. Not a condemner. But in case we think ourselves so self-righteous as the scribes and Pharisees, Jesus gives another example, another definition of adultery. First, God gave the physical act of of, of intimacy with someone other than your spouse, physical intimacy. And then in Matthew 5, 27, Jesus said, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, traditionally, this has been directed at men for good reason. Because traditionally, it seems the men were the perpetrators. But there's a new norm and it makes it so we no longer need to, to have the traditional roles or to take the traditional approach anymore, the traditional targeting of the man. Today, this can just as well read, but I say to you that whoever looks at someone other than their spouse for, for lust has already committed adultery with them in their heart, whoever. Because today we have equal opportunity sinners. For those of you who are not up to speed, and I know there is some, and thank God probably for that, Maybe I'm putting a burden on you, but you can pray for this. You're not up to speed on what's going on. The new norm, the gal asks the guy out. Pays for the dinner. Invites him to her house for a late night drink. And invites the man to sin. This is becoming more and more common. Now, sometimes now what's happening is it's the man who holds out. Yeah. Yeah. And he says, uh, you know, I, I, I really am attracted to you. I really feel a draw to you. But you know what? I, you're going too fast. You know, you know, slow it down here. 
You know, I, I want some. I want some courting. I want some godly trip here. And I don't want to be tempted. I want to, don't want to be drawn into this. David and Bathsheba deal. I want to do this the right way. More and more men are, are standing up and being men. Now, Jim Furby yesterday at the at the men's breakfast, he said, you know, thank God for Pastor Chuck Smith because Pastor Chuck Smith came along and changed everything back with the Jesus movement. Before that, the church was, in the most, for the most part, was feeble and pitiful. The men had all defaulted, and churches were like 80% full of women. Not all of them, but a lot of them, most, a good part of them. And men just weren't in the picture. And Pastor Chuck came along with the Jesus movement and whatnot and got men back in the picture. And then promise keepers and others... But now we have this equal opportunity thing. But it's also an equal opportunity for men to stand up and take the role that the women traditionally took and say, no, I don't want to do that. And although they didn't know it, all of this is exactly what was taking place as the scribes and Pharisees brought that woman to get taken in adultery to Jesus. It's all this balance of what is sin, what is law, and what is love, and and, 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 okay, pastor, but, but, but I've really got it all down. I don't commit either of these two definitions of adultery. I don't commit the physical, and I don't lust after anybody. Well, you don't look at a magazine or, and then, or TV and a little too long. But in case, you know, okay, you know what? 80% of you don't, okay? Then there's a third, adultery part three. There's another serious form of adultery, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, spiritual adultery, which is sin. A sin I dare say we've all been guilty of, individually, corporately, and certainly as a nation. But God, Jesus, he, he takes it to the, the higher level. You may not be guilty of fornication or adultery, but what about spiritual adultery? You want more in adultery, people? People out there, people in here, here it is. Jeremiah 3.20, Surely, as a treacherous wife leaves her husband, so have you been treacherous to me, O house of Israel, declares the Lord. Who's the groom? Jesus. Who's the bride? The church. They had turned their backs on God, and they were worshiping the idols of their time. Now, today we have our own idols. They're sitting out in the parking lot, all shiny and, you know, and now you can get yourself a pair of Maui gym sunglasses that make the colors pop out even more. They're sitting in the neighborhoods. Our material possessions, fame also, status, different pursuits that aren't inherently sin, but when, they, when we take our focus away from God and we put it into a 60-inch, 80-inch TV screen, it becomes an idol. That 80-inch TV screen becomes an idol. I see some people talking to each other. Oh, man, we're gonna, this, we were looking at that 80-inch yesterday. <laughs> TV can be an idol in a box. Sports, hobbies, all kinds of things. Remember in Ezekiel 16, the passage? Remember in Hosea chapter 2, the passage where, where Hosea's wife was taken in adultery and and the message was really, though, wasn't about Hosea who forgave his wife for it, for being a, a loose woman, but, but it was about the nation of Israel. And that's what the, the, it was all about. God speaking to the nation of Israel. A lesson of sin, forgiveness, and restoration because Hosea forgave his wife for the sin. And the Pharisees were missing all of this. They were missing Ezekiel 16.31. Jerusalem, the holy city's own adultery. You erected your shrine at the head of every road and built your high place in every street. Yet you were not like a harlot because you scorned payment. You are an adulterous wife who takes strangers instead of her husband. Men make payments to all harlots, but you made your payments to all your lovers and hired them to, to come to you from all around for your harlotry. You are the opposite of other women in your harlotry because no one solicited you to be a harlot and that you gave payment, but no payment was given you. Therefore, you are the opposite, speaking to the nation of Israel or speaking to America or speaking to, to France or speaking to Australia or speaking to any country. But as I said earlier, 
Jesus came to bring life to sinners, not to death to sinners. And there's restoration for physical adultery, for adultery of the heart, because there are, there's an adultery where you, where you have a, 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 a adultery of, of an emotional adultery. Yeah, you don't do the physical thing, but, but you let your heart be given to someone. And there's restoration for spiritual adultery if we repent. And God loves all sinners. That's why he sent his only begotten son to the cross on Ca at Calvary, right? To die for sinners, not for people who aren't sinners. And, and you know, we're all sinners. Let's get real here. And let's connect the Old Testament and the New Testament dots. In the Old Testament, the husband who wanted to know his wife hadn't committed hadn't committed adultery, took her to the temple, Numbers 5, 17. And the priest shall take holy water in the earthen vessel and take some of the dust that is on the floor of the tabernacle and put it into the water. This process was to prove innocence as well as guilt. Now, what did Jesus do? Just as the Old Testament priest was to pour holy water into an earthen vessel, in Ephesians 5, the water of the word was spoken through an earthen vessel. Who? Jesus. God made Jesus an earthen vessel to speak the word, to pour out the water of life. We talked last week, and I think the week before as well, about how essential, vital water is to life. Air is first, water is second. Have to have water. And just as the Old Testament priest was to pour water into an earthen vessel, Ephesians 5, the water of the word was spoken through Jesus Christ. And in Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. It's all about the water, the word, the cleansing, that he might present to himself the church, Jesus, that is, that he might present to himself the church in all of her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. Now, just as the Old Testament priest was to add dust from the floor of the temple, so Jesus, what did he write on in the temple? In the dust, on the floor. Remember, he's teaching in the temple when the scribes and Pharisees interrupted him, the people, he's teaching the people, they're all enjoying it, and then they drag this woman in. They thought they were, you know, going to have Jesus condemn her or else condemn himself. They want, you know, the Jews themselves were on trial, actually, though, in this situation. The righteous scribes and Pharisees, the self-righteous, that is. They're there in the temple before the great high priest, Jesus Christ. Because we know Jesus Christ is our high priest, amen? He's the one. It's no longer father so-and-so or pastor so-and-so, an intermi inter intermediary it's Jesus Christ who's our high priest. We can go 24-7, the veil's rent. I, you know, I've said this over and over again. The line's never busy. Access all the time. Amen? Of course, we don't use it. Uh, you know, it's not that the phone bill's not paid because you don't pay the phone bill. He's already paid that phone bill. But you've got to pick up the phone or, or, put even, or at least push the button and put it on speakerphone. But what about us? You see, they missed the point because that's what sin does. When you're caught up in sin, when you're enslaved by sin, you don't see the need you have personally. You'll say, I'm free, I'm okay. It's them, it's him, it's those people, it's that group out there. It's her who's in sin. As you point your finger, you find fault, and you put the blame on everyone else. It's my spouse. It's my boss. It's my kid. It's my car. It's my dog. If only my dog wouldn't keep getting sick and take all of my money for vet bills, everything would be great. But we're, as Christians, often, often we're so quick to jump on certain sexual sins. When it's all fornication, physical involvement, the involvement of lust with physical, connect, physical connection and spiritually being a, an adulterer, all, all things other than God in our life. We're all sinners. 
But Jesus came to pour the cleansing water on us, to remove the dirt from our souls. Historically in the church, well, a lot of times sinners have been treated brutally, brutally. It's true. And, you know, we have a tendency to lash out at the, at the sin that isn't tempting us. And, and if you're trying to prove that you're more deserving or of blessing because you're more righteous than the person sitting next to you, more righteous than your spouse, and, 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 and like the Pharisees, you'll be a rock thrower. That's what you'll end up being is a rock thrower. You'll be always throwing the rock at somebody or other, be mad at somebody always mad at having to need someone to be mad at, someone to find fault with. That's just the way it, it, it is. Sin-sniffing dog, fault-finding, keyhole-peeping always takes place in the lives of those who do not understand the grace and goodness of Jesus. But if you realize you're a sinner saved only by grace, you'll see how far you are from what you could and should be in the Lord, and you'll lose your interest in throwing rocks at everyone. When you realize, you know, the Word throws the rocks at us. On a Sunday morning, you know, some, sometimes I know, because I'll, I'll say something from the Word, and then after, someone will be upset. You know why? It's like if you throw a rock at a, into a pack of, of barking, growling dogs, and one yelps. Guess what? That's the, the one that got hit by the rock. And a lot of times on Sunday morning, there's yelping. But, you know, when you realize how much God has forgiven you, that's the key to unforgiveness. When people come to me and they say, you know, I can't forgive them. I really am angry. I hate them. Or I just, you know, I'm always, someone's always out there who I'm mad at. And what I, I always bring it back to it quickly because it's not complicated it's very simple it's the, you're not you're not looking at how much you've been forgiven for and maybe it's because you're dense you're stiff-necked you're hard-headed and you don't acknowledge that god forgave you and you need to be forgiven because once you do that then all of a sudden you become a lot easier on everybody else that's how it works now, how did the law treat the sinner? If there ever was a legal standard that brings salvation, it'd be the Old Testament law in Psalm 19.7. If it, the law was put there for the lawless, for the lawbreakers. And it says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The law is perfect, but the problem was people aren't. And the problem is we can't live. No one can live up to it. And that's why I believe in the midst of the accusations of self-righteousness that the Pharisees were involved in concerning this woman taken in adultery, John 8.8, 8, Jesus wrote on the ground twice. You remember? We just read it. Now in Exodus 32.19, after Moses had received the law, what happened? He got it on Mount Sinai, he returned to the people only to find them worshiping the golden calf. Very disappointing, to say the least. Very disappointing. And what does he do in anger? Because he's disappointed. And what happens to the tablets? They break. And so then where's Moses at? Back up in the mountain, he, you know, he, the tablets are broken. <laughs> he needs them. You know, I can throw my Bible into the shredder, but then I'm going to have to get another Bible. He threw the tablets to the ground where they shattered a picture physically of what the people had already done to the law spiritually. You know, they had just totally broken the commandments. Like, you know, all of them. But the second time, he goes back, and the second time, he gets a copy of the law. And this time, they're not smashed, but carefully placed inside the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah, where they're safe, they're protected. That was a holy, the Ark of the Covenant was, you know, vital. It was 
super precious. It was like, you know, just this awesome thing that Israel owned. And so they put the tablets in there. What else was in there? Manna and Aaron's rod. Sacred things. Things to keep safe. And so the tablets are in there. Covered by the, the mercy seat. And what, do you, what did they do with the mercy seat? What did they, the beautiful gold and everything, what did they do to it? Sprinkle blood on it. And that speaks of the only way the law can be kept with blood sacrifices over and over again, or one on the cross at Calvary. And of course, we know the ark is a type of Jesus Christ. He kept the law. He was the only one who could keep the law perfectly. And guess where that puts us? It puts us in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's us. Amen? And if you're a Christian and you're in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, just as the law, the tablets were in that ark, when the Father looks at you, when they looked at the ark, could they see the tablets, the law? No, because they were contained. They were, you know, couldn't see them. You saw the ark. Well, so I've used the example of the, of the Bible. I can take a dirty rag that I've used on my nose and out during allergy season, and I can stick it inside my Bible, and I hold up my Bible, and what do you see? You see the beautiful Bible. You don't see the cloth because it's inside with the, with the Bible closed. Well, so too our sin. You know, it's, it's contained. It's the father looks and he doesn't see it. Doesn't say, oh, you know, there's, he knows, he knows, but he just chooses not to. And it's beautiful. Now, we talk about positionally and experientially and how, you know, on one hand we, we are forgiven, and we're, but then again we're still the presence of sin and we experience that and all that. But we are perfect in him positionally that's the bottom line and, and we don't have the penalty of sin we have the consequences but we don't have the death penalty now in romans chapter 7 paul declares that we who are believers are dead to the law and this is the glory of biblical christianity for although the rules and regulations are still in effect they are no longer having that penalty that jurisdiction over us because no court of law tries dead people you don't bring dead people to a court you can have the 10 felonies against you but then once you, and, and you could be having gone to court for five years, which people do for one felony, they go for five years. But then you die, and guess what? They drop your case. You drop dead, they drop your case. That's how it works. Now, how does God handle sin? Well, 1 Samuel 5, 2. I, I remember the first time I heard this in Bible college, and I thought it was so cool. I go, it's like an action-adventure movie for them. The, the good guy just smashes the villain. 1 Samuel 5, 2. I got a kick out of that. I still do. And you can look it up, and here's how it goes. Having captured the prized Ark of the Covenant from the Israelites, the bad guys, the Philistines, thank you, placed it in the temple of their fish god. Who gets this one? Yeah, Dagon. And the next morning, what happens when they go to the temple, when the Philistines go to their own temple to pray and to worship? It knocked over. The Dagon, that, I don't know if it was made out of stone or what it was made out of wood, but the idol is knocked over, and it's like face down before the ark. And so what do they do? Well, you know, it just it, we didn't set it up right. So they prop their, their, their idol back up, and then they come back another time, and, and what happened? back down but this time what happened no arms or legs no head everything's knocked off and so then they say you know what bad news this is this is bad mojo this ark of the covenant and we need to get this thing back to the israelites we need to get this out of our our tabernacle out of our place because our temple because this thing is you know not good news for us and dagon especially and the ark we know is a picture of jesus christ and the tablet of stones, the word of God. And we all have these Dagons in our life, these idols out there, whether it be our motorcycle or our boat or, you know, our plane. I don't know. I don't have a plane, but some people do. 
some addiction, some habit, pornography, I mean, on and on. Problems, things that you're trying to get rid of, smoking, whatever, smoking up the temple. It's not, it's not necessarily a sin, but it certainly doesn't help the temple any to be healthy. Some problem you've been trying to get rid of to, to, to knock it out, knock it over, to knock its head off. And the key is don't deal with that. I've always found this to be true. The more I fight and the more I go after that, I, I've never been successful. But when I'm successful is when I bring the ark into the picture, when I bring Jesus into the picture, when I bring in the word of God and I look at the word of God and I pray and, and then it's like a miracle. It's like I, you know, I forget about the fight and the next thing I know, the fight's over. Study the word, obey the word. You are forgiven. Go and sin no more. That's what Jesus came for. And then you watch these idols fall. In Psalm 119.9, how can a young man cleanse his way? That was the question that the, the guy who wrote the psalm was asking. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word, was the answer. Go your way and sin no more. That's what Jesus told the woman. Go and sin no more. And by, by the fact that Jesus came and forgave her and said she'd be free to go and sin no more, she didn't need a, a book on self-helps. She didn't, not that these things are bad. Don't think that I'm saying there, there's no place for them. She didn't need the 10 steps or the 16 steps. She didn't need a counseling appointment or a discussion group, an encounter group, a therapy, any of that stuff. And now, you know, I'm not, I, I say, hey, you know what? If the Dagon is hanging on, use everything you can get. Get the complete arsenal and fight it until it's gone. But include the word in prayer, of course. She needed only the truth to set her free. And people, you know, God tells us things to enable us, not to take from us, not to make us not have a good time. He's not a party pooper. He tells us to make the party better. Therefore, when he tells you to rejoice ever more, don't say, I can't because I'm hurting or, or you know, you don't know my, my husband or my wife. John 15, 12, when he tells you to love one another, don't say that's impossible. You don't know this person or that person. When he speaks something and you read it in the Word, you hear it on a Sunday morning or Wednesday night or, or whatever, Saturday afternoon, or whatever, on TV, wherever, you know, grab onto it. And it's simple. Nowhere in the New Testament do we find a complicated model, a complicated treatment, a complicated cure. It's all simple. But the choice is either ours to reject, to walk away, or to believe and see what God will do. Do your best, let God do the rest. Just that simple. If you simply say, thank you, Lord. Let's pray. This morning, Lord, we thank you. We're going to partake of communion, Lord. And Lord, this day, we're going to receive your mandate, your, your command to, to have communion. And every one of us is going to obey. Pretty, I don't know, maybe someone here is who's in sin, who hasn't forgiven someone, then you shouldn't be taking communion, it says. Don't go to the altar. Or if you're not saved, you really want to be careful because people who weren't saved, they, they in the Bible, they, they got into some big bad trouble when they took the communion. So, and it was, Paul warned about it. You want to be right. But to know that we're set free. And this morning, let's look at our own sin not be nudging the guy next to us and saying, oh, yeah, you know, husband, yeah, or wifey, yeah, as Hansi says, whiffy, yeah, or, oh, yeah, you know, whispering to each other about other people's sin. Oh, man, I wish that so-and-so heard this or, or whatever. That just shows where you're at. That's all that does. Pharisee. And know Jesus came to bring life to sinners, not death to sinners. And that John 8, 12, then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the word, world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Jesus loves sinners, not sin, but loves the sinners. That's why he loves us. And if he loves us the way we are, we need to love others the way they are. Not to condone sin, 
and definitely to love them enough just as he loves us so much that he doesn't leave us the way we are. He certainly works on us and offers us enablement to, to go and sin no more so we don't end up with the consequences of, of biblical sin, but, but yet he loves us. He enabled her, that woman, to go and sin no more. He put her in the Ark of the Covenant inside of the Bible. And when you're in that ark, when you're inside of your Bible, the Philistines, they can't, they can't, the world, the Philistines and the devil can't play with you, can't toy with you like a cat plays with a, a mouse. Can't do that with you anymore. Because you're encased, you're protected by Jesus. Lord, this morning we come to you. If there's anyone here, I don't see anyone who doesn't know you that I know of, but if there's someone here who doesn't know you, Lord, I would just pray that they would take you into their hearts, into their lives. What was that, Lord? I didn't quite get it. Was that a code? Oh, no, it's all simple, you said, Lord. Lord, we come before you and before we take communion, we repent of our own sin, Lord, which there's plenty of to go around in our lives. And Father, we ask that you cleanse us, Lord, Lord, that the water and the dust from the temple floor, the water from the Ephesians, from Jesus Christ, and your grace that wrote on that ground the sins of others to convict the others would speak to us. We'd see your We'd, we'd be washed by, cleansed by your water and we would see in the dust our names and, and what is next to the name. And Father God, we'd be better people because of it. And we'd call upon you for our strength. We'd call upon you for our power because we have such an incredible amount of it. And Lord, we come this morning and we obey this mandate, this command to have communion. So we can be obedient, obviously. We take what represent, what's represented by this unleavened bread, and that's your body. And this isn't your real body, of course, but it represents that body that you gave on that cross at Calvary for our sins, that we might be cleansed. And we come and we, we take it and we do what you told us to do. We remember what you did in the Old Testament, what you do in the New Testament, what you did at Calvary, and, and what you do in the future. Our sins are, of the future are forgiven, not just the past, but the past, the present, and the future. And, but yet you do tell us to, to confess and to, and to repent, and, and it's, it's all a mystery, but it's the command, and we obey the command this morning by partaking of the, of the bread together. Let's do so. And Lord, we have adultery part one, physical part two, emotional part three, spiritual. And Lord, we put all this stuff at the cross. You died for it all. And Lord, we, we just give it to you and we ask that we can walk out of here better people, Lord. And we thank you that this grape juice contains primarily water. And it's by that Holy Spirit, water, power, and also by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, that we're healed, we're forgiven, we're cleansed, we're so many things. And we come before you, partaking, lifting this up. You're here with us right now, Lord. Your presence is here. It's always here. We just have to be aware of it and acknowledge it. And so we do. We acknowledge it, and I pray that everyone's aware of your presence here this morning, Lord. And we take of that mystery of communion. Let's partake together. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God, for this beautiful morning. Thank you for the beautiful testament. Thank you for the simplicity of it, Lord, that it's universal, can be taken anywhere in the world to any people, rich, poor, educated, uneducated, any language, and it can be received or rejected. This morning, Lord, we...
choose to receive it. We thank you that when we receive it, we get blessed and mighty things happen in our lives. And first of all, we are blessed. And then we become more of a blessing to others because we give up those Dagons. And the more we give up our Dagons, the healthier we become. And the healthier we become, the more we can spread good health to others. Spiritual health, physical health, emotional health. So this morning we just pray, Lord. We thank you. Ask a blessing upon all those out there in, in, in live stream world and, and of course all those here this morning. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Okay, God bless you people. So that's it. I mean, I don't care what you say. We're not going to have adultery part four. No way. <laughs>